we're good to go. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to From Docker Push to Bytes on Disk. My name is Wayne Warren, and I'm a senior engineer at DigitalOcean. I work on the DigitalOcean Kubernetes product and the DigitalOcean Container Registry product. I'm Adam Wolf Gordon. I, I work with Wayne at DigitalOcean, where I'm also a senior engineer. Uh, today, we're going to talk about container registries, and we're going to talk about what they are and how they work, and give a bunch of those details. Uh, but before we get into the details, though, I did want to give a little bit of a disclaimer, which is that container registries can do a lot of stuff these days. They can store artifacts and things that aren't containers. Um, they can have uh, additional metadata like bills of materials and signatures and things like that. And we are going to ignore all of that today. This uh, talk is in the 101 track, so we're going to stick to the most basic use case of pushing and pulling container images from your registry. Before we get into a bunch of details, let's answer a really basic question. What is a container registry? To answer that, let's start with something most of us have probably seen or done before, and that's a Docker push. So you Docker push, some ASCII arrows fly across the screen, and your container image is now somewhere in the cloud. Later, your coworker or some random stranger on the internet or a deployment system can pull that image and run it somewhere else. So this is the power of containers, as we all know. You can share the image, and it should just run on somebody else's computer. The thing that stores those images in the cloud, that's a container registry. So we know what a container registry does for us, but what's underneath? It's a content addressable data store. And what does that mean? Uh, it's an object store, so it, you can put data there, and it's content addressable. Uh, that means that for each object in that store, instead of being identified by some arbitrary key or path name, it's identified by a digest of its contents. In, container, uh, in a container registry, we have a few different kinds of objects. First, we have blobs. These are the, the basic object that, uh, that are stored in a container registry. Uh, and then we have manifests, uh, they are, which are metadata about images and the contents of the blobs. Uh, so they tell us what layer blobs are stored in each image. You can think of manifests as a set of pointers to layers. Uh, and then finally, we have tags. Uh, so tags here are drawn as a different shape because they're special. They have uh, human-readable names, and they're mutable. Uh, I mean, not a different shape, but a different color. So. <laughs> uh, uh, since manifests and blobs are identified by their contents, uh, they're immutable. Um, uh, change the contents and you change the identifier as well. Tags, on the other hand, you can update later. So there are many different registry implementations, but the one we'll talk about today is a CNCF project called Distribution. This was previously the open source registry implementation released by Docker. They donated it to the CNCF in 2020 and it is uh, the reference implementation for other container registries. Uh, but it's also used by many people in production, which includes us at DigitalOcean. Our hosted container registry platform is built on top of this code base. So we've heard a little bit about what a container registry is, what it looks like inside. One sort of mystery that we haven't talked about is those ASCII arrows that fly across your screen when you do a push. Uh, how does your container image actually get to the registry and that data get into the cloud? And the answer to that is the OCI uh, distribution spec. So this is the HTTP API uh, that's been standardized that registry clients use to talk to registry servers. Uh, it, like I said, it's a standardized API. It reached V1 last year, so now it's really official. And um, it, it's vendor neutral. It was originally written by Docker to go with their registry implementation, but it's been adopted and updated by the Open Container Initiative, or OCI, uh, which is a community. So it is vendor neutral. There are lots of different implementations on both the client and the server side. Uh so now let's dig into the distribution spec and the distribution code base, uh, and we'll walk through some practical examples. 
So starting with what a push and a pull look like from an API perspective in the distribution spec, and then we'll dive into the distribution code base to see how it's structured and how it implements uh, image pushes on the server side. And then finally, we'll wrap up with uh, garbage collection, which uh, is basically the process of uh, cleaning up or uh, freeing up disk space after deleting images. So let's start by looking at what happens in the API in this distribution spec when you push a Docker image or a, a container image to a registry. Remember, uh, this spec is standardized, it is vendor neutral, so everything that we're gonna talk about in this section is applicable to any implementation of it. Um, we're gonna use Docker as our sort of example commands, but that uh, is not important, you could be using some other tool. So remember this diagram from earlier, uh, this shows what's in the container registry. This is all the objects that need to make it to the registry when we do a push. And we talked earlier about how the manifest is a sort of pointers to these layers, it references the layers. That means that as a client, we need to push the layers first and then the manifest because the spec says that a registry is allowed to reject an object that has references to non-existent objects. Um, You'll notice that I didn't talk about the, the tag. That's because the tag actually gets pushed as part of pushing the manifest. It's sort of an additional piece of metadata that's attached to the manifest. Uh, it's not really a separate object in the registry, um, even though we, we kind of think of it that way conceptually. The other thing to uh, point out before we talk about the, the mechanics of the API is that different container images can share layers. So in this diagram, we have this layer called D655 and so on, and it is shared between two different images. One that's already in the registry, the one that's on the bottom at sort of full saturation, and this one that we wanna to push to the registry on top. Uh, as a registry client, we can push that layer again if we want to. Uh, there's no harm in doing that other than we're gonna waste some time because the registry is going to deduplicate it. Um, but we don't have to do that. As an optimization, we can figure out that the uh, registry already has that layer and then we can skip pushing it. And most real implementations uh, on the client side are going to do this. So jumping into the spec and what the requests and responses look like, um, the first thing we're gonna do is check whether the layers that we need to, that we wanna push are already in the registry. And to do that, we use this uh, head endpoint. We identify the, the blob using its digest, which is a hash of its contents. And uh, the registry is going to return a 200 response code if it already has that blob. If it doesn't have the blob, it's gonna return a 404, and then we know that we need to push it. Once we've figured out which blobs we need to push, we're going to actually push them. And this is a little more complex because the distribution spec gives us three different ways to do it. These three different methods all do effectively the same thing. Uh, they do three different steps, but they do it in different combinations of requests. So the three steps that we need to do are first initiate and upload. The, initiating the upload lets the registry know that we're about to push some data to it, and it will return us a session ID that we can then use in subsequent requests to refer to that upload. The second thing we're gonna do is actually push the data. That's, I think, the obvious part. You gotta provide the data to the registry. Finally, we're going to finalize the upload. When we finalize the upload, we provide the digest that we've calculated of our uh, layer blob, and the registry then can calculate the, the checksum itself, make sure that it got the right data, that what we said we were gonna send it is actually what we sent it. This finalization step is important for another reason other than integrity. It's also important to uh, make sure that the registry isn't going to make in-progress uploads available to download for clients. So we, we don't tell the registry the digest until the end, uh, that way, it, it's not is not even able to make that upload available to a client to download until we've pushed all the data and it knows that it's there. So uh, each of these different methods, these three ways of pushing, like I said, does those those three steps in different combinations. Uh, in some cases, two of the steps or all three of the steps are combined into a single HTTP request. But the most common method that we've seen from clients is the chunked method on the right there, uh, in which each of these three phases has its own HTTP request. So the, the first request is a post that initiates the upload and the registry is going to return the session ID that we'll use in the rest of the requests as a client. 
Then we're going to upload chunks of data using these patch requests, again referring to that session ID. Finally, when we're, when we, once we've uploaded all our data with these patches, we're going to do this put request. That's where we provide the digest and say that we're done pushing. The registry can then make the blob available for download. In practice, uh, what we've seen from clients, in particular the Docker client, is that it uses the chunked upload method, but it provides all of the data in a single chunk. And the reason I wanted to, to call this out is that there's no capability negotiation in the distribution spec today. So there's no way for a registry implementation to communicate to a client that it only supports up to a certain chunk size or that it only supports a certain number of chunks. Clients can make really any assumptions they like about that. And the assumption that Docker makes is that it can transmit that entire blob in a single patch request. So if you've got a 10 gigabyte uh, file system layer, you're gonna get a 10 gigabyte patch request, a 10 gigabyte body. And that's important to know if you're implementing a registry or hosting a registry like we are, because uh, there's all kinds of uh, timeouts that you might assume are, are reasonable that turn out not to be reasonable when you have a client making a gigantic patch request. One other option that the spec allows is called blob mounting. Um, everything in a registry is scoped to a repository, which is kind of a namespace. That's what you might think of as the image name uh, when you're thinking about your container images. As a client, if you know that you share a layer with uh, an image that's in another repository, you can ask the registry to please uh, just just share that layer between the two repositories and avoid uploading it. Uh, registries don't have to allow this. It is optional. And also, the registry might not have that layer. Maybe you didn't push it. Maybe it got deleted. Um, but if it does allow it, and it does already have the layer, you and you include uh, these extra parameters on the post request when you initialize the upload, it'll return uh, a two I'm just making sure I have the right code. It will return a 201 response to your request. Um, and that means that you don't have to go through the rest of the sequence of pushing your layer. That layer is already there. It'll just reuse it from that other image. If it doesn't allow it or it, it doesn't have the uh, data, then it'll return a 202. And you just proceed with your upload as normal. So this is an additional option on that post request to initiate the upload um, that you can do to uh, avoid pushing data in many cases. Once the registry has all of our layers, we can push the manifest. And this is relatively simple. There's only one way to do it. The uh, little variation that there is is that there's this parameter called reference in the URL. And that can be either a digest or a tag. I say that uh, if it quacks like a digest, it's a digest. And the way that a digest quacks is it has a colon in the middle separating the algorithm, like SHA-256, from the checksum, or the hash, which is a big, long hex string uh, you've probably seen. Um, Registries can differentiate between the two formats this way. You're not allowed to have a colon in a tag, so um, that's, that's how it works. Um, if you push using a tag, that does implicitly create the digest reference in the registry as well, because remember, everything in the registry is identified by the hash of its contents by this digest. So the tag just, if you push by a tag, you now have two ways to refer to your manifest instead of just the digest, but you can push either way. So spec-wise, here's what the image push looks like end-to-end. -end. First, we're going to check whether each of the layers that we want to push exists in the registry using that head endpoint that we saw. Then we're going to push each of the layers that we need to push. Uh, in this example, using the, the three-part post-patch put uh, chunked upload. And then finally, we're going to push the manifest using either that tag or the digest like we just saw in the previous slide. And that's it. At the API layer of abstraction, uh, this is what uh, an image push looks like to a registry. We're going to go into another layer of detail in, in a couple minutes. But before we do that, I wanted to look at the, the other side, at the Docker pull, just for completeness, uh, so that we introduce the rest of the endpoints in the spec. So as a reminder, um, back to this diagram again, these are the objects in the registry. As a client, this is the things that we need to pull. And if, if we want to pull those layers, we need to know which ones they are. So as you might expect, this is kind of the opposite of the push. We need to pull the manifest, and then we can pull the layers once we have the manifest and know which layers they are. Pulling a manifest looks a lot like pushing a manifest. You remember the duck. You can use either the uh, tag or the digest. And um, it, the only difference here is that it's a get endpoint instead of a put endpoint. 
pulling blobs is much simpler than pushing blobs. It is uh, a single endpoint. It's the same as that head endpoint that we used to check for existence, except now it's a get, and you'll get back the, the data that's in the layer. Um, that's, that's really pretty simple. So spec-wise, again, um, here's the, the endpoints that are used when you pull an image. We've included the two head endpoints in there that you can use to check for existence. You don't have to do that when you're pulling an image, but you might want to just as an optimization to make sure it has everything that you need. Um, but really, you're just going to use these two gets, one get to get the manifest, and then a series of gets to get all the layers that you need. And with that, I'm going to hand things off to Wayne, and Wayne's going to talk about how all of this stuff is actually implemented, which I think is the, the more complex part than the, the spec that I just talked about. Thanks, Adam. Uh, now that we've covered the practical user-facing elements of the distribution client-server interactions, let's pop open the hood and take a look at the internals. So the internals can be roughly understood in terms of four layers. The HTTP API handlers, uh, the OCI abstraction interfaces, which allows the uh, API handlers and developers uh, uh, to uh, well, developers using distribution as a library to operate on abstractions defined by the spec. And then there's the storage driver abstraction, which allows these OCI abstractions to be defined in a way that is generic over backend implementations. And then finally, there's the backend implementations themselves, which allow users or uh, operators of distribution to choose their backend. This is, of course, an oversimplification that leaves out numerous features provided by distribution, but it's useful in that it allows us to roughly understand what's going on when images are pushed to, pulled from, or deleted from a registry. Uh, now let's take a closer look at each of these layers. The HTTP layer doesn't contain many surprises. It's a straightforward mapping from HTTP endpoints uh, to handlers, which themselves make use of OCI abstractions. So in an ideal world, you might expect uh, OCI abstractions to be a relatively straightforward mapping between types and their operations. In the real world, and especially in an open source project built over a long time by many contributors with different goals and ideas about how code should be structured uh, and different use cases for that code, uh, things tend to get a little bit messy. So I don't want to belabor the details too much here or to disparage the code as by representing it as overly complex. Um, instead, I just want to give a sense of that complexity and to emphasize that in spite of it, this code can be really useful for us as container registry operators since uh, they serve not only the registry API itself, but also uh, they can be the back end um, or uh, form part of the back end for product specific features like uh, the container registry product at DigitalOcean. So the last interface I'd like to visit is the storage driver. This interface is what enables OCI abstractions and the container registry more generally to target a variety of backend storage systems, from in-memory, which can be useful for local testing, to production-ready object storage systems like an S3 API. Uh, so there's the AWS S3 API and various um, open source implementations, as well as uh, DigitalOcean Spaces, um, which is an S3 API uh, as well. So for a registry operator who wanted to make distribution work with a new backend, this is the interface that they would have to implement to do so. And then uh, they could run a registry on top of whatever their backend is. All right, so up to this point, we've talked about the broad strokes of HTTP interactions involved in image pushes and pulls, as well as a high-level overview of the distribution internals. Next, we'd like to make good on the promise of the talk and discuss how these elements fit together uh, from Docker push to bytes on disk. So if you recall earlier in the presentation, we illustrated an ideal image push workflow where at a high level, the client first pushes all image layers, then pushes the manifest referencing those layers. 
In order to illustrate image push to bytes on disk, we will be zooming in to examine uh, the interface methods involved in uploading an individual image layer. More specifically, we'll take a look at the HTTP patch function for the blobs uploads endpoint. Here you can see the uh, HTTP endpoint where N is the name of the image within the registry. Also, uh, we've referred to it as the repository um, because that's the name of you know, an image in the spec. Um, and then S is the session UUID shared across all chunk upload patch requests. So what exactly do we mean by uh, from Docker push to bytes on disk? Uh, in the context of the blob upload patch request, what we want to do is highlight all the interface methods and objects involved in the and the sequence in which they're called to store a chunk layer in the configured backend. So in our case, the configured backend is an S3 API. So at a high level, the patch involves three phases, authentication, resuming the session, and uploading the data. During the authentication phase, we obtain credentials from the patch request header validate those credentials in a way that depends on the method in use. So uh, I've um, listed a few uh, potential authentication methods, basic auth, bearer token, or JWT, and OAuth. After we authenticate, we can move on to resuming the session. So we need to resume an established uh, uh, session during each patch request in order to continue uploading a given blob uh, to the back end. Uh, this is keyed on the session ID as a path parameter in the patch request. So first we get the blob store associated with a specific repository, which is an interface in front of the storage driver that provides blob-oriented session upload semantics. We validate the session ID given in the request by attempting to retrieve a stored session keyed on the ID. Uh, using the stored storage driver's get content method, which in this case translates to a uh, get object S3 API call. And then once we've validated the session ID, we can retrieve a writer instance from the storage driver to continue the in-progress blob upload in the next phase of the patch request. Uh, I realized, by the way, <laughs> uh, that this is maybe going into a little bit more detail than you might want out of an, uh, a 101 session. Um, but this, the slides are available online if you're interested to um, take a closer look. Uh, anyway, um, the, the next phase is the data upload phase uh, where we stream the incoming patch request body using the S3 blob writer we just received when resuming the session. And practically speaking, this is implemented using an IO copy that reads from the patch request body and writes to the S3 blob writer as bytes are received from the client connection. The IO copy will call write on the S3 blob writer repeatedly as bytes are streamed in from the patch request body. So we don't buffer anything in memory here. Uh, well, we don't buffer the entire request in memory, I should say. Uh, we do, however, buffer um, a little bit. So internally for our S3 backend, um, the writer makes use of a multi-part upload and each part in an S3 multi-part upload has to meet a minimum size requirement and that's imposed by the S3 API itself. So because of this, the uh, write calls to the writer that don't meet the minimum size will buffer locally until that requirement has been met before being pushed or until explicitly committed uh, through the storage driver. Uh, so commit is a method on the storage driver, which I don't think I illustrated here very well. Um, uh, also note that um, here in this diagram, we show the create multi-part upload and the complete multi-part upload, but those aren't invoked on every uh, patch request. Uh, the create multi-part upload is only ever invoked on the first patch request, and then uh, the complete multi-part upload doesn't happen during any patch request. Instead, it happens during the final put in the chunked upload sequence of post patch put. <clears throat> so yeah, um, this more or less wraps up our uh, somewhat hand wavy explanation of how bytes traverse distribution from HTTP to bytes on disk. I call it hand wavy because we kind of stopped before we got to the disk at the S3 API because obviously different S3 APIs can 
be implemented in uh, uh, different ways, and that's not the topic uh, topic here. So, yeah. Uh, now that we've covered how the bytes get onto the disk, kind of, uh, let's consider how they get off the disk. Uh, for distribution, this happens through a process known as garbage collection. In programming languages, garbage collection is a memory recovery feature where the runtime uh, detects, not all programming languages, some programming languages, um, where the runtime detects unused blocks of allocated memory and deallocates them for, uh, to free them for sub subsequent use. Similarly, in distribution, garbage collection is a disk usage recovery feature. To understand what garbage collection uh, is in the context of distribution, let's revisit the container registry diagram from earlier, where we had just pushed a new image and updated the latest tag to point at it. The old image, uh, represented here by the top manifest, is now in an untagged state. While this manifest could be deleted directly through the API, untagged manifests can be garbage collected. That is, they can be detected as untagged and automatically deleted. Once a manifest is deleted, either manually or by garbage collection, it may leave behind what we now call unreferenced layer blobs. Unreferenced layer blobs are blobs which are no longer pointed to by manifests in the registry. Such blobs are now eligible for either manual deletion or garbage collection, similar to untagged manifests. Uh, after garbage collection is run, disk, disk space is freed for use by subsequent image pushes. So garbage collection, then, is really a, a convenience feature that removes the need for the user to manually delete things uh, that could be deleted. So one question you might be asking yourself is, why is blob collection necessary as a separate process from manifest deletion itself? Shouldn't we be able to just automatically delete any blobs that are no longer pushed to, or, or sorry, no longer pointed to by manifests after we delete the manifests? Well, without getting into too many details, because uh, this is the second to last slide, uh, uh, and those details could constitute their own separate talk, uh, the reason is that there may be reads, writes, and deletes happening simultaneously on a given registry, uh, and for a given image or set of related images. So because the distribution API doesn't make any guarantees around atomicity, the design of internal interfaces, particularly the storage driver, uh, don't take the possibility of simultaneous uh, reads, writes, and deletes into consideration. So one resulting risk then is that a delete that happens by one user during another user's write could lead to data loss for the writing user because uh, the writing user may see the blob as existing uh, before they begin to push their image and decline to push it, or, or sorry, uh, before they begin to push their layer and decline to push it, assuming it will be there um, at the same time that another user is deleting that layer. Thus, in order to safely delete objects without incurring data races uh, or loss, that would lead uh, to data integrity issues, we need to set a given registry to read-only mode before we can safely run garbage collection on it. That's, that's it for today. That's our uh, talk about container registries. Um, hopefully you learned something from this or, or learned some things you already knew maybe if you already knew about registries. Um, I think we do have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, before we get there, I did want to say we've got stickers. They're on the, uh, the table there if you want some stickers. And, and we're also happy to chat after. And I have more stickers in my backpack if we run out. So. They're, they're really cute stickers if you're not yeah. familiar with DigitalOcean stickers. <laughs> they're like little sharks in different outfits. So um, yeah. But if we've got some questions, uh, online or in the room here, we can uh, get that started. Yeah, the microphone is just in the middle. Okay, so we have, uh, we have a question from, uh, from the live stream. Could distribution be used locally on Kubernetes nodes to import images from a mounted distributed backend? Will that speed up the import of big images? Yeah, absolutely. You can run can you, distribution. Can you repeat as well? Oh, yeah. So, sorry. They, the question was uh, whether you can run distribution inside a Kubernetes cluster to uh, give you some locality of, of where your images are. The answer is yes. That's a really common use case for it. Um, 
you, you can run distribution pretty much anywhere. And, and like Wayne alluded to, there's lots of different storage backends. So you could store images on local disk. You could store them in uh, local object storage, like in your own cloud or in your own data center. You can also use um, S3 or, or S3 compatible storage. So uh, you can absolutely do that. Um, distribution does also have a mirroring mode that's explicitly meant for that. Um, we don't use that for our registry. We're using it in, in sort of the, the other uh, mode where it's the source of truth, but um, that is an option that's there as well. Um, if you have to set the registry to read only, how do you like n stop uh, users not like pushing? Like how does that affect your users, I guess? Sure, do you, do you want to handle that? Well, that would uh, differ. Um, I mean, that, that depends on how, uh, how your product is impl implemented. So at, at uh, DigitalOcean, we have a container registry product, and we use uh, a, a bearer token, a JWT, for authentication. And they have an expiry set on them. So when, we, uh, when a user uh, schedules garbage collection, which happens through the DigitalOcean API, um, we mark the registry as read-only mode, so, and we no longer issue write-capable um, JWTs. And then uh, the expiry on, on our JWTs, I think, is at uh, 15 or 16 minutes. So uh, garbage collection um, is then scheduled to begin once the last, uh, last issued write-enabled JWT has expired. Oh, thank you very much. Yep. In the... Um Generic distribution, uh, I think it actually goes into a different mode where it just doesn't accept any write requests. But yeah. since we are serving multiple users and we want them to each be able to garbage collect independently, we have to um, yeah, do some things with, with tokens to make that work. Yeah, we yeah, can repeat yeah. your question. Yeah, about the read-only modes, how does that work from a user experience standpoint? So if I try to push an image, what, we would return an error, or we would just make it wait? Or? Sure. So the question was, uh, with this read-only mode for garbage collection, what's the, the user experience for that? Um, the answer is that, that you uh, get a, effectively an authentication failure, um, at least in our implementation of it. I think in the generic implementation, you get either an authentication failure or um, some other kind of, of HTTP error back if you try and do a, a write operation. Um, so there's no, like, backlog of, of requests or anything like that. Um, it's on the user to retry it. Sure. So the question was, um, given that the client doesn't provide the digest until the end of the, the layer push, how do you handle simultaneous uploads of the, the same layer, potentially? Um, the answer is it would just get uploaded twice, and and the last one will win. They're going to get uploaded into the same. Uh, at the end of that upload, they're going to be moved into the same location in the backend storage, um, so the the second one will will end up overwriting the first one. But they have the same content, remember, because they have the same digest. So so that's okay. Um, but there are definitely are cases like that where you're going to end up with a double push if you have the same layer being pushed twice simultaneously. Does that answer the? Good question. Yeah. Where, where are labels stored? Uh, where are labels stored? By, you what, mean like tags? Right. Yeah, I believe the key value labels in Docker become part of the manifest. I'm not 100% sure about that, though, so I, I would have to. Yeah. Okay. Do, you, do you know, Wayne? Well, I'm not, I, I don't know if I can answer that question specifically, but one thing we didn't uh, cover here is what a manifest is, which is, a, a, it's, it is itself a JSON blob. So it gets stored actually as a blob um, in the registry. Uh, and, it, and it contains all of the information about your image, and like not just the layers, but different annotations and you know the time it was created. Um, largely dependent on the uh, runtime that built the image. So different runtimes may have different um, extra metadata they add to the manifest. But, but yeah, it's a, it's a JSON blob that gets stored similar to um, layer blobs. When you re-upload the image, you write the JSON repo. 
does, are we using the repo digest or the image ID? Uh, so yeah, so the question is when you uh, push an image and you're using the um, digest, is it the, the image digest or the image ID? Uh, so I think the image ID is specific to your container runtime, so your, your sort of local container client. Um, what, what gets used for the upload is the, the digest of the manifest. So it is the, the hash of the manifest uh, contents. So like, like Wayne said, the, the manifest is a JSON file, basically. Um, so you take a hash of that JSON file, and that's the image digest. Great. Any other questions, or are we? Oh, yeah. One more. So the most popular one is uh, are others supported or is it just? Yeah. So the, the question okay. is uh, what uh, digest algorithms are supported for the, the uh, hash digests? And um, there are two officially supported by the spec. That's SHA-256 and SHA-512. In theory, um, somebody could propose another one like SHA-384. I, th I think SHA-384 is mentioned in the... In the in the docs, if you if you read the spec itself, but it's not like officially meant to be supported, um, and that that actually uh, gets into a tricky area of because uh, you have to verify the digest at when you receive the blob. So if you're getting the chunked blob upload and you don't have the digest itself uh, for the blob until the last post or uh, put request, um, what? Uh, what algorithm should you choose when you're, um, you know, cal calculating that digest over the course of several patch requests? So the default is just SHA-256. Um, that's, in fact, the only uh, algorithm I've seen in use in, in practice when, whenever um, supporting a customer who has a problem with a container registry. Um, but yeah, if so, so that's the only one that distribution calculates by default. If at the end of a chunked upload uh, the digest for like SHA-512, then distribution will go and download the entire blob from the back end and recalculate it at whatever algorithm was specified. But you could also, in theory, calculate all supported algorithms in, in a, a, like, you know, concurrently um, as you're taking the, the chunked upload. Does that answer your question? I kind of got off on a tangent there. Okay. All right, I think we're a little over time, so we'll probably wrap up the, the questions now, but uh, feel free to come and chat with us uh, afterwards as well and um, grab some stickers. Thanks, everyone.